Sports. I'm here with Nick Robolik from Pixel Metal. We're talking about Spaghetti Western Mayhem Sombrero. Yeah, it's just Sombrero. It's kind of it's a Sombrero. Spaghetti Western Mayhem is kind of the, the subtitle that when I was laying out the logo, it looks better if I put it on top of it, basically. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's. What, what kind of game is Sombrero? Uh, it's a uh, it's a local multiplayer. I like to call it couch multiplayer. Uh, spaghetti Western themed uh, uh, multiplayer. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a, a, um, a Super Smash Brothers or a, or a, or a Tower Fall. It's a bit faster than that. Um, the scale the scale of the stages is a lot bigger than uh, than actually both of those games. Now that I think about it, uh, and it really is about running around, kind of hectic action. Definitely plays better with three or four players um, than less. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So would you count things like uh, Tower Fall or Samurai Gun as influences or just contemporaries? Well, I um, guess it'd be both. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would say contemporaries. I, start, I started on Sombrero uh, before, before I think I played either of those games. No, definitely before I played either of them. And the original idea for Sombrero came came long before either of them had uh, had been released. I used to sit at work sketching these little sort of Western characters on Post-it notes and shoved them in a drawer for a couple years. And then when I was when I was trying to figure out a, a game after the last one I was working on, I just decided after I sort of roughed it out that it wasn't it wasn't what I wanted it to be. It felt a little generic, um, and I wanted to do something with a bit more personality that had a, that had a bit more me in it, I guess. Uh, I pulled I pulled those old sketches out that I had stuffed in the drawer and you know scanned them into the computer and, and traced over the characters and cleaned up the artwork and and now we have now we have sombrero. Okay, and it's primarily you're doing everything the programming the art and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm doing uh, I'm doing all the programming the art and animation um, most of the, most of the marketing stuff too. I hired a few illustrators to do to do some of the promotional stuff for for Oticon actually. Uh, 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 a woman named Christine Crossley, who did actually the giant banner that, that we're sitting underneath. Um, a fellow named Dan Maplethorpe that uh, that did another another postcard, and a fellow named uh, Saeed Masah. I hope I'm saying that right. I think it's my, actually Saeed Messiah, but not spelled like Messiah. It's spelled differently. It just sounds like that. Um, and then I have a guy named Nathaniel Chambers, who is uh, who's doing the soundtrack. But, it, but in terms of the game content, it's basically just me and uh, uh, Nate's music. Okay. So I know there's a deathmatch mode in the game. What other modes do people uh, look forward to playing? Yeah. So yeah, there's the deathmatch. That was a that was a requested one that, that I hadn't really planned on originally. Um, in addition to that, there's there's what I call loot mode, which is more about running around and, and getting money and collecting uh, uh, or, or capturing campfires, I should say. Uh, and they provide score multipliers. There's a there's a capture the flag. And there's a mode that I'm calling Banditos, where the goal is to hold the golden monkey skull the longest. So basically, whoever has the golden monkey skull gets chased by all the other players trying to get it from them. It's kind of the opposite of tag. So, so whoever, you know, whoever shoots the player that has the skull, then they get the skull. And everyone starts chasing them, and it's a sort of a big, a big chase across the stages. And, and because those stages have hazards, and the, stage, uh, the, the hazards on each stage is different, um, that can really... Just those slightly different game modes, even in the same the same stage layouts, can really can really mix up the gameplay. Especially when you start playing around with power ups that that have their own you know pluses and, and minuses depending on what stage you're on. Give me an example of some of the power ups. Sure. So there's a um, there's a shotgun, of course, uh, like oh, a, sc- a, a gun. It's 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 a Western game. There has to be that. Um, there's a, there's a Gatling gun. There is uh, uh, dynamite. That sort of that, that, that kind of arcs like the uh, the axes in Ghouls and Ghosts, but it's more useful than the axes in Ghouls and Ghosts. Oh, that arc. Um, yeah, the arc is just, uh, but it's, it's fun that when it gets to the end of the arc, it explodes. That makes it become really useful. Uh, there's a cannonball that bounces around a lot, and there's this sort of weird 1950s style alien gun that shoots out, you know, like wave with the, the circles like you'd see in, a, in, a, in an old black and white episode of, of Lost in Space. That's what's in there right now. There's a few more power-ups coming that I'm, that I'm still working on getting in there. Uh, as well as some power-ups to, you know, increase the jump height, um, mess with the player speed a little bit, uh, give a temporary shield, that kind of thing. Because all the characters play the same, as a single developer uh, building everything, it's hard to add character variation past their appearance when there's 
20 characters in the game, uh, especially when some of them are from from other indie games, and I don't want to I don't want to mess with your characters. Basically, I'm just I'm just glad they let me put them in there. What uh, uh what games? What characters? Uh, so right now there is a guy named Thief who's from a game called Treasure Adventure World that was a pretty big Kickstarter success a couple years ago. Uh, and it's actually where I got Christine Crossley from. She's the art director for that game. This is the uh, character where you have the parrot and the hook for an arm? That's the one. Okay. Yep, yep so he's in there. Um, Shout out to uh, Steve Orlando. Steve Orlando, that's right. We met, we met at one of the game events in New York and, and sort of hit it off. And, and it worked out really well. I got his character and I borrowed his art director. <laughs> And uh, you know uh, they're 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 putting one of my characters, uh, the, a, a robot guy named Edward, uh, in uh, in Treasure Adventure World. He'll be he'll be one of the uh, non-player characters. That's cool. Cool. It's, it's very cool. Uh, I was really happy that that worked out. There's um, there is another character named Meat Slayer, who who is not a Revolver of Meat Boy, which some people seem to think he is. He's a he's from a a soon to be released. A uh, mobile game made by the guys that do an online comic called The Meatly at TheMeatly.com. Um, so that's why his name is Meat Slayer. Um, I don't know why it's Meat Slayer, but it, it works. Uh, I'm not judging. I'm not judging either, you know, if, if, that's, if that's what he's happy with, that, but that works for me. Uh, and then there is also uh, Cheese Wedge, who's from a game called Organic Panic. It's another local multiplayer game. Oh, actually, they may have added the internet recently. It's all to say another multiplayer game that's competitive. It's just the vegetable Vegetable. shooting platform. Okay, I've... I've It's uh, meat and cheese versus versus vegetables. Vegetables. Okay, I played this on Steam. That's a fun game. Yep, yep, they're on Steam Early Access. Uh, They're working right now, I think, on on an Xbox One port. I didn't realize that. Okay. Um, Well, I think they said it in their Twitter feed, which probably means I'm allowed to to tell people... (laughs) If they said it publicly somewhere. This is, this is live. Fingers crossed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, I hope you know how to edit because I ramble a lot. Um, and uh, so those are the three that are in there right now. There's a few more that I can't say who will be in there uh, post-release because one of the things I want to do is after I finish up what I'm working on now, just the last few stages and a few more characters, uh, and obviously finishing up the game modes, uh, is I want to make sure that I get out some good DLC for it. And that's, that's uh, free DLC. That's not paid DLC. I like the... I like the Valve approach. That's of, the best kind of DLC. That's the best kind, and I, so I, I like the Valve approach of adding more content, like they've been doing with, you know, Left 4 Dead and Team Fortress. You don't want to have a forty-dollar season pass. That seems. Uh, um, that's a step in the wrong direction. I'm trying to think of a, of, a, of a polite way to put it. That seems like something that a horrible person would decide to do. Um, which, of course, is a, is a huge choice. But I mean, you know, big big game studios, maybe they. Maybe they feel a need to do that because it, the it, brothers it, it, of Warner. Yeah, I mean, it costs it costs a lot of money to, to produce DLC, and, and it, I mean, even if, even if it's just time. Um, but you know, it, it, I, I want to make a game that has some legs on it. That's not something that people are going to play for a year or two. You know, I, I, so I want to keep adding content to keep making it better, to keep making it bigger, uh, without expecting people to keep just throwing money at me because I decided that I want to add more stuff to it. I like that attitude. Good. I hope it works. <laughs> I hope it. I hope I actually, you know, I hope it actually ends up being successful. You know, I, people seem to like it so far. I don't. I don't really hear too many, too many complaints about it. Uh, and, and I've never heard anyone say they they hate it. So, so I like, I'll, I'll assume the best. I like the controls. I like that you. Uh, it's twin stick, but you, you jump with the the buttons on top, the triggers or the bumpers, but it frees you up a lot. Yeah, I um. I, I, I tried doing jump with, with the A button, which I got a lot of requests for, but then of course because it, it controls like a twin stick shooter, you have to take your you have to take your thumb off the off the stick that you can you can shoot with. And that didn't really feel right to me. So after people play a round or two, they get very, very used to the triggers being jump. And because of course the triggers are analog, which most of the face buttons are not, when you hold the trigger down longer you can jump higher. You know, that's not something that, that is 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 as uh, um, Straightforward to do as a player or as a developer if you're just using the face buttons on the on the controller. It ends up feeling very natural, especially because people can choose whatever button they want to jump. So the lefties can choose the left stuff, the righties can choose the, you know the right buttons. Yeah, I mean, there's just people that are just happy either way. Yeah, they can hit whatever button they want on the top of that controller, whether it's a PS controller or or an Xbox controller, and, and the character will jump when they hit that button, whichever one it is. All right, well, Nick, thank you for your time. I guess the last question is, well, we know um, one of the platforms slated is Steam, obviously. Right. And are you looking at anything else? 
Yeah, so the, the initial release uh, I'm hoping will be uh, across all desktops, so Windows, OS X, and Linux. Um, and then after I get that out, uh, my next my next goal while I'm working on the DLC is is to is to get cranking on the Xbox One port. You know, now that now that Microsoft is, is only I think only a week away from from when we're recording this uh, to releasing the Windows 10 update for desktop and Xbox One, it's going to make it a lot easier for indie developers to get their games onto the Xbox One because it's basically running Windows 10 once that really, once that update. Comes. I do believe that Windows 10 is coming in the fall, but definitely uh, Windows 10. Uh, July 29th. Oh, I thought it was just PC. Uh, I thought the, the Xbox update was coming a little further uh, along. Maybe I wasn't supposed to say that out loud. Oh. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're doing some updates. No, I'm just kidding. You're allowed to say, I'm allowed to say that out loud. They're, so they're doing some updates in July to, to head towards that, that compatibility. Um, and when that, when that July release hits with the tools that they've already released for desktop, we'll be able to start testing it on Xbox One. So so official support for it worldwide is a little bit later in the year, yes, but it'll be... The dev community it, will have their hands on it. We'll, is... we'll, we'll have access to that. Anyone really will be able to have access to it. They're not... They, they don't have a dev kit, you know. Their dev kit is an Xbox One that you bought in the store. So technically anyone who ever wanted to make a game could just go buy an Xbox One True. and get cranking on, on working on one on, on Windows 10. And once, it, once it's officially released... Uh, uh, for Xbox One, get their game on Xbox One fairly easily. Which is exciting. It's a good thing for indie games. That does sound good. I love indie games. So. And it's nice to say something nice about Microsoft when everyone always says horrible things about them all the time. Well, they, they've made some mistakes, but they're doing their best yeah, to I mean, try to get back into the good graces. Yeah, all, all, big, all big companies make mistakes, like you said, with Warner Brothers and some of their more egregious pricing of, of the DLC. You know, they'll, they'll learn their lesson, and, and things, will, things will balance out. I'd like, like to they, think like so, do. but this is the same company yeah. that with Batman uh, Arkham Origins said that, hey, we're not going to fix this game because we're working on DLC. <laughs> yeah, that was probably a, a, what I would call a marketing misstep on their part. And it happens. Yeah. And, it, and it, it, it happens somewhere. Someone, whoever said that was probably not supposed to say that. No, no, they were not. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But the good thing about them saying it is that it sort of spurred the community to nudge them enough that, that they at least fixed some of the issues, if not all of them. They did. I mean, they stopped selling it on PC until they fixed it. Yeah, which is good, but it also points to the fact that they know they should not have released it yet at all anyway. <laughs> they pulled it, you know. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. It's a little, you know. They, they, had a, they had a worldwide release date they wanted to hit, and... Come hell or high water, they released the game, even though it wasn't quite ready. Which is, you know, it happens. It happens to small developers, too. All right, well, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick.